Conspiracies are as American as apple pie. All that require is two or more persons joining together to commit a, an illegal act. So when a couple of guys knock off a 7-Eleven store, they're committing a conspiracy. The key issue in the case of JFK is the fact that the, the government, even the day of the assassination in Dealey Plaza, the Secret Service and the FBI both advanced the hypothesis from which they have never wavered that th there were three shots fired, one hit Jack in the back, one hit Big John Connolly in the back, and the third hit Jack in the head and killed him. That was the Secret Service position on 22 November 1963. That was the FBI position on 22 November 1963, and they've never revised it. On the other hand, it turned out that a distant bystander by the name of James Tagg had indeed been hit by the fragments from a bullet. And therefore, that could not be one of those that hit Jack or Big John. And therefore, they had to account for all the wounds in, in JFK and John Connolly on the basis of only two shots. This led to rather creative thinking about how this could be done and the proposal, the invention of what is known as the magic bullet theory. To wit, the hypothesis that a, one bullet entered the back of the base of Jack's neck, exited his, his throat about the level of his tie, went into the back of John Connolly, shattered a rib, exited his chest, wound, uh, impacted with his right wrist, and wound up deflected into his left thigh. No less an authority than Michael Badden, MD, a one-time medical examiner for New York City, but who more importantly headed the medical panel that reviewed the JFK medical evidence when the whole case was reinvestigated in 1977-78 by the House Select Committee on Assassinations after the showing of the Zapruder film on a Geraldo Rivera program in 1975 led to a huge resurgence of interest in the case. No less an authority than Michael Badden has observed that if the magic bullet theory is false, then there had to have been at least six shots from three different directions. This is the crux of the case. If the magic bullet theory is false, then there had to have been at least six shots from three different directions. What I'm going to proceed to do is show you the evidence that demonstrates conclusively not only that the magic bullet theory is false, but that is provably false and indeed turns out not even to be anatomically possible. So roughly speaking, it's about a, as, as dead an hypothesis as an hypothesis can be. Now, if you want to find additional supplemental information about JFK, uh, it's my, been my privilege to work with the best qualified individuals to ever study the case, and it's led to the publication of three different books. Uh, assassination Science with 11 contributors, Murder in Dealey Plaza, 9 contributors, and the Great Zapruder Film Hoax, 6 contributors. And the bookstore uh, has very kindly arranged to be here and has some copies of those books if, if that's something you'd like to pursue. In addition, you can visit my website, Assassination Science, and you'll find a JFK introductory seminar that presents a critique of the, what I call the, the, the lone nutter theory, uh, plus an excellent introduction about the alteration of the Zapruder film, which I'll explain had to be recreated to conceal what actually happened on that day. So here's basically Dealey Plaza, a three-shot scenario, but the question becomes what happened when you extract one of those bullets and have to count for everything on the basis of two. What I'm telling you is that the, the, the crux to understand the assassination of JK, JFK revolves around a very simple question, namely, where did the bullet that hit JFK in the back impact? The naval artist who was asked to draw this diagram of the bullet, and this is the trajectory allegedly taken by the magic bullet, was not allowed to see the body. He was given a description of what he should write, uh, what he should draw. Here's another drawing. So you see where that first bullet is supposed to have hit. Look how close it is to the spinal column. 
I'd say it's very near on top of the spinal column. If you were to reach your hand around there, you'd find that's a very bony part of your body. Notice the other bullet is supposed to have impacted about the vicinity of the little bump in the back of your head on an upward trajectory, assuming Jack is head is inclined and Oswald was in the, the bookstore above and behind him. So here get this initial scenario. The motorcade came down, came down uh, Main Street, came down Main Street, turned on Houston, then took a 110 degree turn onto Elm Street. There were several things wrong with this scenario. A 110 degree turn was in violation of Secret Service protocol. You're never supposed to take more than a 90 degree turn. Coming up on Houston, if there had been a lone gunman in the sixth floor, he would have given up his best possible shots by not taking them then. And it seems far-fetched to imagine he would wait until the limousine had turned and he had to fire through a tree. But that's the government's position. This is the man they picked up. They actually had uh, the, the assassination took place at 12.30. By 12.45, they already had an all-points bulletin for a, a man described as around 30 years old about uh, five foot 10 and 165 pounds, which must have described hundreds and hundreds of residents of Dallas at the time. Uh, he, he, he was only 24 years old, but he did look older. He would subsequently be apprehended at a local theater, the Texas Theater, about an hour after the assassination occurred. Uh, I always thought that was pretty fast work. Here's a photograph that was used to convict him in the minds of most American it appeared on the cover of Life magazine. It shows Lee Oswald holding this, uh, this World War II um, a carbine, a uh, Mannlicher Carcano, uh, universally regarded as perhaps the worst small arms weapon ever manufactured. It was known as the humanitarian rifle in World War II for never actually harming anyone on purpose. He's wearing a pistol belt and a, and a revolver with which he allegedly shot a Dallas policeman, J.D. Tippett. And he's holding two uh, communist newspapers, The Militant and The Worker. When Oswald was shown a photograph during his interrogation, he said that it was his face pasted on someone else's body. He actually had a, his chin had a, had a, came to a kind of a point and had a cleft. This is a block chin, not Oswald chin. There's an insert line above the chin. The shadows don't appear to be right. The fingertips are cut off. There were lots of reasons to believe that this was a faked photograph, a point to which I shall return. So here's a scenario now when you take out, exclude the one additional bullet. This is taken, a diagram taken from a book by a very famous apologist for the Warren Report by the name of Gerald Posner, published a book called Case Closed. I would say Gerald Posner has probably had something in the vicinity of 10,000 hours of exposure on television, whereas critics of the Warren Commission put together might have a couple of hundred max at the outside. According to this scenario, it was the first shot that missed, hit a, hit a, hit a branch of the tree, and then ricocheted off to hit uh, James Tagg down in this vicinity. Then the second shot was the uh, magic bullet, and the third shot was the shot that hit Jack in the back of the head and killed him. So here's a, here's a different diagram then of the magic bullet. Now notice, this, uh, the location of the bullet doesn't seem to correspond exactly with that ori original diagram. It seems to be a, a little bit lower and uh, to, the, to the right of the president. But this is the general idea of the magic bullet theory, that it passed through Jack's uh, neck, exiting around his tie. Here you can see it seems to be below the collar. There's something equivocal about that. And then the damage it did in John Connolly. It mentions here that the speed of the bullet, the Mandlicker Carcano, could only fire uh, bullets uh, with a muzzle velocity of 2,000 feet per second, which means it's not even a high velocity weapon. Interestingly, all the death certificates on Jack, and there were at least three. Uh, the Warren Commission report and subsequent studies have all claimed that he was killed by the impact of high velocity bullets. So if you want a real simple argument against Oswald having committed the crime, since the man liquor Carcano was not a high velocity weapon, it cannot have fired the bullets that killed him. Now here's another diagram, and I want you to notice now that the location of that wound seems to have moved somewhat to the right. Remember now, these are government diagrams. The, the, the artist is being told exactly what to portray so that the government could have portrayed this any what, which way. But notice where it is located now. It's more to the right. It is clearly the base of the back of the neck. Well, how can we test that, okay? 
How can we test that? Here's the jacket the man was wearing. The hole in the jacket is about five and a half inches down below the collar. That's not the same position that would occur if, in fact, he had been hit at the base of the back of the neck. Here's the shirt he was wearing. The hole is about five and a half inches down below the collar, corresponds to the jacket. The shirt and the jacket, interestingly, were left at Bethesda, I mean, were left at Parkland Hospital in Dallas and were not taken to Bethesda Naval Hospital, which is a violation of basic autopsy protocol so that the physicians who were who were conducting the autopsy on Jack Kennedy, two naval officers who'd never performed a gun, uh, an autopsy on a gunshot victim before, did not have available to them the shirt and the jacket. Here's a diagram showing the location of a shot here uh, in the back, approximately five and a half inches below the collar. Now you could argue that maybe the shirt and the jacket might have holes, but why would they then correspond to the, to the body? This is one of the autopsy physicians, J. Thornton Boswell's diagram. And interestingly, it has been verified by Admiral George Berkeley, who is the president's personal physician. So we have reason to take this to be an accurate depiction of the wound to the back, about five and a half inches below the collar. This is an FBI agent who was president. He and his uh, partner were there during the autopsy. And notice how he draws the location of the wound to the back considerably lower than the location of the wound to the throat, suggesting that it's highly improbable that a bullet that entered there could possibly have exited at the throat. In fact, they wrote a report. He and his partner wrote a report that described this wound as having entered at a downward angle on a 45 to 60 degree downward angle, has entering only about as far as the second knuckle on your little finger and having no point of exit. Now here is a death certificate executed by the president's personal physician who says that he was killed by a massive wound to the head, which is not described, but then adds that there was a, a second wound at the level of the third thoracic vertebrae. Now this is a Navy Admiral, he's a physician, he's the President's personal physician. He describes this wound as at the level of the third thoracic vertebrae. Where is the third thoracic vertebrae? Well it just happens to correspond to the location of the hole in the shirt, the hole in the jacket, and the wound locations described by the FBI and the pathologist who is conducting the autopsy. It's about five and a half inches down below the collar. Some apologists have tried to explain that the, Joe, the, the jacket or the shirt were bunched up. Jack Kennedy, of course, wore custom-tailored clothing, and it's very unlikely they were bunched up. I have had great difficulty seeing any films where Jack was bunched up that didn't look as though they might have been doctored. But the point is, while the bunching up might account for a different location in the shirt and the jacket, it could not account for a different location in the body. It turns out that even the Warren Commission staff believed that Jack had been hit about five and a half inches down below the collar. Here you have a stand-in for him in one of the reenactment photographs, and you see the large patch on the back, and then the much smaller uh, patch where he was supposed to have been hit in the head. This is one of my favorite photographs from the entire assassination literature. This is the young uh, junior counsel, Arlen Specter, holding a pointer to demonstrate that the path that the magic bullet would have to have taken if the magic hypo bullet hypothesis were true. If you look down below his hand about four or five inches, you'll see the patch on the back of the stand-in for Jack Kennedy, which means that a photograph that's intended to illustrate the magic bullet theory actually refutes it. We have discovered how the change was made, not by altering the body, but by altering the description of the wound. Uh, in the aftermath of the release of Oliver Stone's film, JFK, another tremendous surge of interest led to the passage of a JFK Records Act. George Herbert Walker Bush, the former director of the CIA, was president at the time. He adamantly opposed this legislation. When it passed over his opposition, he refused to appoint the five member civilians to the board which had to await the Clinton administration, took a delay of about 18 months, which in essence telegraphed to the agencies that they could clean up their records because the AARB was coming. Uh, when they did get in place, however, they were entitled to release documents and records from the CIA, the FBI, the Secret Service, the, 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 the ONI, the, all of the above, and the only entity that could override their decisions was the President of the United States. They succeeded in releasing some 60,000 documents and records, and among their very first releases was documentation that Gerald Ford, who was then a representative from Michigan, who was a member of the Warren Commission, had the description of the 
wound to Jack's back changed from his uppermost back, which was already an exaggeration, to the base of the back of his neck that we know was done by Gerald Ford. He has acknowledged doing it, and just before the publication of Assassination Science, the New York Times ran a story about it, which was in time for me to include it in the book. Among those with whom I have had the privilege of working is a fellow who has not only a PhD in physics uh, from Wisconsin, but an MD from Michigan. He's board certified in radiation oncology, which of course is a treatment of cancer using x-ray therapy. His name is David W. Mantic. Uh, David took a patient with a similar chest and neck dimensions to JFK and plotted the trajectory that the magic bullet would have to have taken if that hypothesis were true. As you can see from the trajectory, it would have had to impact with cervical vertebrae. In other words, there is no possible, no anatomically possible passage for a bullet to take that trajectory, which may explain why Arlen Specter, when he questioned the physicians about this wound, did not ask them what they have observed or what they had inferred from what they have observed, but rather posed the following hypothetical question. If we assume that the bullet entered here, locating that very upward location and passed through the neck without hitting any bony structures and then exited the throat, would that mean that this wound to the throat, which had been very much disputed in terms of its nature, was a wound of exit? And for example, Malcolm Perry, who'd performed a tracheostomy on the president right through the wound to the throat, which he had subsequently at a press conference that began at 3.16 that afternoon, had described three different times as a wound of entry. In response to a reporter's question, he said, yes, it was coming at him. It appeared to be a wound of entry. Replied to Specter's hypothetical question that, yes, indeed, it was true, if you made those assumptions, that this would be a wound of exit, but, he added, he was not in the position to vouch for or verify the assumptions he'd been asked to make. And of course, it was a triviality to say, if, if the bullet came in here and went through the neck without hitting any bony structures and came out here, would that make this an exit wound? Obviously, it couldn't be anything other than an exit wound. And that is how Arlen Specter repeated that pattern of questioning with the physicians and was able to, in effect, uh, conceal that there was no anatomically possible trajectory, which David Mantic has now proven. So here you see, if you take into account the actual location where the bullet entered five and a half inches below the collar, you get a lampooning of the official story because the bullet then has to have made these amazing detours in flight inside the body of the man, Com coming in here, then a direct left, leftward, and so forth, which led to, in Oliver Stone's film, uh, Jim Garrison, played by Kevin Costner, ridiculing the theory and saying, no bullet has taken such a fantastic path. And of course, that would be true if, if, if it had followed any such trajectory. But we now know that, in fact, it did not enter at the base of the back of the neck. It did enter five and a half inches below the collar. And the, the evidence for it is as compelling as any evidence in, in the entire case. This, by the way, is the magic bullet itself, which shows essentially no distortion, slight longitudinal if you look at it. But in, in uh, one of the uh, books, A Murder, for example, I published a photograph of the magic bullet along with test bullets that were fired by the Warren Commission and the House Select Committee into wads of cotton or buckets of water, and they are indistinguishable. In fact, the physician Robert Shaw, by name, who attended John Connolly when told that this was the bullet that was supposed to have performed all these feats and done all this damage, said he thought that that was most unlikely since he had already removed more lead from John Connolly's wrist than was missing from that bullet. However, like other evidence that contradicted the official government account, it was simply swept under the rug. So what actually did happen? Malcolm Kilduff, press secretary, announcing Jack Kennedy's death, pointed to his right temple, said it was a simple matter of a bullet right through the head, attributing that report to Admiral George Berkeley, the president's personal physician. Uh, I consulted with uh, Charles Crenshaw, MD, who was one of the physicians who was present in trauma room one when Jack Kennedy was, was treated. He was the last physician to attend him. He actually closed Jack Kennedy's eyes before he was wrapped and put into the coffin. And I asked Charles if he could draw me a diagram of what the wounds looked like that he observed. 
Much to my astonishment, the government never did that. Here's a very simple task you could ask any of these physicians to perform. And what he reported was, in the case of the throat wound, it was a small, clean, simple, clearly wound of entry. By the way, now, these physicians at, in Dallas at Parkland Hospital was, were extremely experienced. The, Dallas at the time had the highest homicide rate in the country. And it was very easy for them to discern these wounds. And as I said, Malcolm Perry had performed the tracheostomy. And so this is before and after the tracheostomy, which was a simple straight line incision, uh, and who had reported three different times during that press conference that it had been a wound of entry. Uh, they, they concurred that this had been a wound of entry to the throat. And notice, by the way, once the magic bullet theory has been discounted, you have to explain the wound to the throat and the wounds to Connolly on the basis of other shots and other shooters. So the situation is very much as, as uh, Michael Batten described. If, if the magic bullet theory is not true, then you've got to account for, say, the shot to the throat, perhaps two shots to John Connolly, one in his chest, the other to the wrist, say, and the, and the thigh. Uh, you've already got uh, a shot to Jack Kennedy's head. You've already got the shot that missed, so they're adding up. Here's, there are six shots right there already, and that's not to account for any of the shots that missed, of which there were at least three. So here's the other diagram he drew for me. This is the back of Jack Kennedy's head. He said this is quite a substantial cavity, a huge defect. It was about the size of a, a baseball or the size of your fist when you double it up. You put your fist back there, double it up. You can see that's a pretty enormous hole in the back of the head. Here's another drawing by another uh, physician of the, the appearance of Jack, uh, back of Jack Kennedy's head. This looks pretty much the way most of us believe this probably looked at the time. Um, it was a huge defect. Notice the tremendous consistency. This includes witnesses at Parkland, uh, witnesses at the hospital, uh, others. This, this, is, this is Crenshaw right here, by the way. Uh, Beverly Oliver was on the opposite side, opposite Grassy No, with a camera taking a f film that the FBI later asked for and promised but never returned. It probably would have been the most revealing footage in terms of shooters on the vicinity of the Grassy No. But just look at the tremendous uniformity here in witness reports about the wound to the back of the head. So how did they conceal that? I mean, you know, you have these sophisticated doctors and they're looking at this medical record and they are not seeing that massive blowout to the back of the head. Well, here's a David Maddock, MD, PhD, expert in radiation oncology. He makes decisions affecting life and death on the interpretation of x-rays for his patients all the time. He told me before he went into Bethesda Naval Hospital to uh, the National Archives in Maryland, to look at the original autopsy x-rays, this is already back in uh, 1992, that he thought he was going to find evidence of an additional shot to the head, a second shot to the head, but he said he also thought he would find evidence that the autopsy x-rays had been altered. And I said, David, I said, either way, we have what we're looking for. So he went in, here's a pre-mortem or while alive x-ray, this is to give you a form of orientation, an x-ray of Jack Kennedy's head before he, while he was still alive. And of course, I, I, I use an inverted Cecil Stoughton, this very famous photographer, who was Jack's photographer, photographed to give you a sense of how it's oriented. Notice the relative lack of contrast between black and white. David said that's very typical. What struck him about the autopsy x-rays, the post-mortem, uh, after death, was a tremendous contrast between dark and light. He said it was way, 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 I mean, you know, hundreds of times out of the ordinary, that it was aberrant, which is why he thought he was going to find evidence that it was, had been altered. Now, because he had this background in physics, he was able to apply a simple technique from physics known as optical densitometry that measures the amount of light that passes through an object that's been exposed to x-rays that enables you to calculate the relative density of the object whose exposure to x-ray created the image. The more dense the object, the more radiation the object absorbs and the less radiation impacts on the photographic plate. So in this case, uh, a very light image if the material was very dense. And he performed this technique by measuring, you know, square centimeter, square centimeter. I mean, the guy is methodical and thorough and patient to a fault and discovered that there was an area at the back of the skull uh, which had been, as it were, patched by using material that was much too dense to be human bone. And he outlines that here and refers to it as area P for patch. Okay? So unless the back of Jack Kennedy's skull was nothing but solid bone, unless Jack Kennedy was a bonehead, in other words, this was not a naturally occurring phenomenon. 
Interestingly, the physician who was on duty in charge of radiology the night of the autopsy, a fellow named John Ebersol, just happened to have as his specialty radiation oncology, the same as David Mantic, which I think may be how David was able to figure out what had actually happened here. So look at the dimensions of that, the area where it was patched. It was on the basis of this altered x-ray, you see, that the government was able to discount the eyewitness reports of more than 40 witnesses and you saw a sampler there of a whole lot of them who reported this massive blowout to the back of the head. Here is an image from the Zapruder film frame 374. Uh, so far as I know, I'm the first person to have noticed that in reworking the film, they had committed certain omissions. Here you can actually see in the back of the head a defect to the back of his head. There's also a part of the skull that's uh, extension here. It's on a kind of a flap that's open off to the right. But here, just notice how much this massive defect to the back of his head corresponds with the area designated by area P on David Mannick's analysis of the x-ray. David has discovered it's very easy to alter x-rays, and the x-ray film that was available in 1963 could be more easily altered than the x-ray film that's available today. Here he's done one with a prehistoric bird, and another he's introduced a pair of scissors to show how simple it is. Here's the anterior posterior. The x-ray we've been looking at is the right lateral cranial or the right side of the skull. This is the anterior posterior front to rear. David also discovered an anomaly here, which is that the most conspicuous object in the x-ray is this uh, 6.5 millimeter metallic slice with a bite out of it at about 5 o'clock. Okay. Now it appears here and in the, in the other x-ray uh, located here. But he, his studies on, uh, on this objects show that this was uh, also added to the x-ray. You get inconsistent results when you analyze the x-rays in different ways as he has done. And the original studies, by the way, that establish this result are all published in assassination science. Notice the tremendous black area here. That, that would indicate where there was missing mass. Now, you were looking at the Zapruder film if you were here earlier, and you notice this huge bulging out to the right front. Well, that suggests, you know, that would be consistent if you had a, a high-velocity bullet going in the back of the head and then exiting the right front. It could take out the whole right front of your head. So it, this x-ray appears to have been contrived in order to uh, support such a scenario if such a scenario were to be employed. But in fact, we know that Jack didn't have a missing right front of his head. In fact, Jackie, who was holding him in her arms the whole way to uh, Parkland Hospital, said from the front, you know, he looked perfectly normal but she was having a terrible time holding on the back of his head. So here you see, this is uh, sometimes called the stare of death photograph. There's something funny going on here. It's like there's a patch using tape right there, and that appears to have been the entry location, by the way, for the, the bullet from the right front. Notice how the throat now is tremendously exaggerated. This has led some students to the case, such as David Lifton, who wrote the book Best Evidence, uh, which first published in 1980, a brilliant book on the medical evidence to infer that the body might have been altered. Certainly it suggests that either the body has been altered in this respect or that the photographs have been faked. And in fact, we have a lot of evidence that the autopsy photographs have been reworked. This is the back of his head where, where the government claimed there was a shot to the head from the back. Originally it was supposed to have entered here, you may recall. Later it was claimed that the bullet hole actually was moved here to the top of his head, but there's never been any actual evidence other than drawings that would substantiate that claim. It is the case that there's a distribution of metallic particles in the x-ray that supports the entry of an exploding or frangible bullet to the right temple and in a slightly upward direction in relation to the president's head at the time. And, and this, this shot fragmented and created shock waves that were very forceful and blew his brains out the black of, back of his head with such force that a motorcycle patrolman to the left front hit with the brains and blood, thought he himself had been shot. Extruding from this massive blowout to the back of the head were two kinds of brain tissue, cerebral and cerebellar. I won't read it all, but this is physician after physician talking about these two kinds of brain tissue being blown out the back of the head. There's quite a difference here. It's in between the, the parts of the brain involved. Uh, the, the cerebral tissue would be from, you know, ordinary gray matter. The cerebellum is this more compact part of the brain at the base, and a first-year medical student would have trouble differentiating between the two. The cerebellum would have a more hamburger-like uh, reddish character, whereas the, the, the cerebral matter would be more grayish or maggoty-like. So this is a very substantial difference. 
a world authority on the human brain, Robert B. Livingston, MD, who was a scientific director for the National Institute of Mental Health and the National Institute for Neurological Diseases and Blindness in both the Eisenhower and Kennedy administrations. Uh, the most distinguished American I personally have ever known. He was a, a world authority on the human brain. He produced a, a documentary on the gross anatomy of the human brain that won every award there is for, photog for films in this category. He founded the first department of neurosciences in the world at the University of California, San Diego. He taught at Stanford and, 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 and Harvard and was a truly exceptional human being when he was brought into the government service. His qualifications were so great that they had to create a new higher civil service rating just because of Bob Livingston. He was not only an authority on the human brain, but he was an expert on wound ballistics, having supervised an emergency medical hospital for injured Okinawans and Japanese prisoners of war during the Battle of Okinawa. So uh, uh, Bob Livingston studied the uh, diagrams and photographs of the brain in the National Archives, the brain itself mysteriously missing and arrived at the following conclusion. It simply cannot be true that the cerebellum could have been seen extruding from the occipital parietal wound by several experienced and thoroughly competent physicians and for the same brain to be seen in superior and lateral photographs and depicted in a drawing superior view showing the cerebellum as being apparently intact. A conclusion is obligatorily forced that the photographs and drawings of the brain in the National Archives are those of some brain other than that of John Fitzgerald Kennedy. Now, I could look at those reports from the physicians, and I could look at these drawings, and I could say the same thing, but it wouldn't count as much as it does coming from a world authority on the human brain. So when we start sizing up, you know, all the wounds to Jack Kennedy, here we have a report from the mortician, Thomas Evan Robinson, during an interview he gave in May of 1992 with an independent investigator by the name of Joe, Joe West. He says there's a large gaping hole in the back of the head that was patched by stretching a piece of rubber over it. He thinks the skull was filled with plaster of Paris. Large gaping hole in the back. Smaller wound in the right temple, crescent shape, flap down about three inches. So here's the entry wound that, that frangible or exploding bullet that after the bullet to the back of his head actually had been weakened by a prior shot that, that weakened his cranium. So then, then blew it out his back of his head. Approximately two smaller shrapnel wounds in the face packed with, with ice. The, the trajectory for the bullet that hit Jack in the throat, and we have a tremendous amount of evidence for this, actually passed through the windshield. And David believes that the small wounds to the face uh, shrapnel wounds were pieces of glass from the bullet passing through the uh, windshield. Interestingly, uh, many of the witnesses at the time said the first shot sounded different than all the rest. It sounded like a firecracker. And a researcher by the name of Jim Lewis has been going through uh, junkyards in the south and firing high-powered rifles through windshields, uh, often at dummies, to see if he can hit them with success. And when the bullet passes through the windshield, it makes the sound of a firecracker. There's a wound in the back, five to six inches below the shoulder, to the right of the backbone. That, of course, is the wound that refutes the magic bullet theory and leads us to conclude, as Michael Bodden observed, that therefore there had to have been at least uh, six different shots from three different directions. The adrenaline and the bra brain were removed, the other organs removed and then put back. No swelling or dis discoloration to the face, which means that he died instantly. But, of course, Jack was a uh, Roman Catholic, so they delayed pronouncing him dead until it was possible for a priest to pronounce last rites, but in, in fact he was, he was killed instantly in Dealey Plaza. Now here's a, here's a photograph very famous by an Associated Press photographer by the name of Alchins. It has very interesting features. Number one, if you look carefully, you can see where the president's left ear would be visible if it were visible. You can see a small white spiral nebulae that has a dark hole in the center, which is indicative of a through and through hole in the windshield. Multiple witnesses at Parkland Hospital, for example, observed this, including uh, police officers, one of whom stuck a pencil through it. Others observed it back in Washington. However, the the vehicle, the, the presidential limousine, would be taken back to Ford Motor Company on Monday, the day of this formal state funeral, and completely rebuilt from the ground up, including replacing the windshield. And one of us who's an expert on this, uh, an attorney by the name of Doug Weldon from 
Kalamazoo, Michigan, tracked down the Ford official who had been responsible for replacing the windshield, who confirmed that it indeed it did have a through and through hole in the windshield. We, we recognized that whoever would have instructed this, this crime scene on wheels, which belonged intact, uh, not only for forensic study, but as a historic relic in the Smithsonian Institute, could only have been done at the level of a J. Edgar Hoover or a Lyndon Johnson, that it should be sent back and completely rebuilt and dismantled. Number two is a figure in the doorway that greatly resembles Lee Oswald. In fact, there was a co-worker of Lee Oswald by the name of Billy Lovelady. Uh, Oliver Stone and many other researchers believe this was Billy Lovelady, uh, a, a researcher who is a, an emeritus historian from Wisconsin by the name of David Roan believes it actually is Lee Oswald. All the evidence that I have been able to unearth, however, indicates that Lee Oswald was actually in the second floor, uh, a lunchroom where he was drinking a Coke. He was observed in and around the first and the second floor at a quarter of 12, at 12 o'clock, at 12.15, as late as 12.25, by Carolyn Arnold, who was the secretary, the executive secretary to the vice president of the book depository. And then he was confronted there by a motorcycle patrolman named Marion Baker, who pulled his weapon on Oswald and held him in his sights until Roy Truly, the supervisor, came along and assured him that this was Lee Oswald. Uh, they both said in, in statements they gave to... Uh, the Warren Commission that you can find published in the Warren Report, that he wasn't perspiring, he wasn't agitated, he seemed perfectly normal, uh, although as truly added, uh, he was a bit startled as anyone might be to suddenly find themselves confronting an officer with a drawn weapon on them. And uh, the, Officer Baker wrote down that he was drinking a Coke. Now, just think about the scenario and its commercial possibilities. According to the official story, this man who's just assassinated the most powerful man in the world, what does he do? Rush across a warehouse, stash his man, trusty man, liquor carcano, race down four flights of stairs to do what? To enter the lunchroom and, and have a Coke. So you have him holding his weapon in one hand and his bottle of Coke in the other saying, things really do go better. It's a fantastic hypothesis. It is the case that the officer was later instructed to strike out the phrase that he was drinking a Coke. But it certainly appears from all the evidence that that was the case. I mean, this is as distinctive as if he'd written down he was wearing a black beret. Can you imagine anyone writing down that somebody was wearing a black beret if they were not wearing a black beret or writing down that he was drinking a Coke if he wasn't drinking a Coke? But attempts to revise the evidence have been manifest throughout this case. Third is a window in the Daltex building adjacent to the book depository. This was the closet for a uranium mining operation that was a CIA front, and from which three shots appear to have been fired. The shot that missed and injured the distant bystander, James Tagg, the shot that hit Jack in the back of the head, and a shot that missed and hit the chrome strip uh, over the windshield. And then fourth, you can see there's a response. I mean, the president's Secret Service agents are looking around like they have no idea what's going on. But here, Lyndon Johnson's door is already open, and his Secret Service agent is already on top of him to protect the vice president from any threat. Here's what the actual scenario looks like. It's rather more elaborate, as you would imagine, than from all of the evidence that we've accumulated that shows the magic bullet theory is false, and therefore there had to have been at least six shots from three different directions. From the top of the county records building, a shot appears to have been fired. This appears to be the shot that hit Jack in the back. Another shot that actually wound up in the grass here appears to have been fired, which no, may have been due to some sort of deflection, right? Maybe the shooter was, you know, somehow affected just as he was trying to squeeze off the round because they were so wildly out. Three shots I've already described from the Dahl Tex building. No shots appear to have been fired from the sixth floor. Uh, two or three shots appear to have been fired from the opposite end of the book depository. These were all shots that hit John Conley. John Conley always insisted to his death that he was not hit by the same bullet that hit Jack Kennedy. So here the witness, one would presume, in the best position to know, always denied that the, the magic bullet theory. And in fact, in, in testimony he originally gave, but which now largely exists mostly in edited versions where they have taken out the following remarks. Uh, John Connolly said he looked back to his right to see what was going on, couldn't see, so he turned to his left. And it was while he was turning to his left that he felt this doubling up in his chest from the impact of a bullet. Well, by turning to his left, he was exposing his back to the side. And those shots that hit Connolly from the s appear to have been fired from the side. The, the, the shot that went through the windshield that hit Jack appears to have been fired here from the on the north and south side of the triple underpass, because there were three roadways that converge here in this overpass, 
or above ground sewer openings where a man could have excellent cover for a field of fire if he had some camouflage. And uh, Doug Weldon has actually got in there and mapped out the trajectory. It's a perfect trajectory, and that appears to be where that shot was fired. A shot was fired from the grassy knoll, but oddly enough, it appears to have missed. And then on the opposite side of the triple underpass, there's a parallel. It was a symmetrical design, a parallel above ground sewer opening, which appears to be the location from which the shot that entered Jack in the right temple, the frangible blew out, that blew out his brains, was fired. If you notice, the limousine here is considerably further down the roadway in relation to, say, the steps. The vehicle was actually in the vicinity of the concrete steps when the final shot was fired. Uh, although in the Zapruder film, you'll see that it's a very different impression of, of, of what's taking place. So if you add up this evidence, it really can have considerable I impact on alternative hypotheses or theories about what took place. Consider the following. While the Mafia no doubt put up some of the shooters, they could not have extended the reach into Bethesda Naval Hospital to alter x-rays under control of the agents of the Secret Service. Uh, and, and nor could the KGB, although it had the same ability to alter a film as the CIA and Hollywood, been able to get a, its hands on a Zapruder film. Nor, of course, could any of these things have been done by Lee Oswald, who was either incarcerated or already dead. When you add all these considerations together, and realize that there are more than 15 indications of Secret Service complicity in setting the man up from the hit, including that the, 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 the manhole covers were not welded down, the crowd was allowed to spill out into the street, the open windows were not covered, it was an improper route, the motorcycle patrolmen were ordered to stay behind the rear, window, the rear wheels of the, of the uh, limousine, which they said was the most damnedest formation they'd ever been instructed. Most tellingly, in my opinion, the vehicles were all in the wrong order. The presidential limousine should have been in the middle. They changed the order and put the presidential limousine first. They canceled a flatbed truck that would have had reporters riding in front of the presidential limousine. It was just canceled. The military officer, his, his chief aide, who would normally have ridden in the front seat of the limousine between the driver and the agent in charge was moved to the last limousine. The president's personal physician was put in the last limousine. If that military aide had been in place, it would have been impossible for that shot to have gone through the windshield and hit Jack Kennedy because it would have been an intervening body. The driver, you may not believe this, pulled the limousine to a left and brought it to a halt in Dealey Plaza after bullets began to be fired and only accelerated and drove off after Jack had been twice in the head. He was hit once in the back of the head. He fell forward. Jackie eased him back up. She was looking him right in the face when he was hit by that frangible or exploding bullet. And David surmises he actually fell forward and believes that the back and to the left, back and to the left motion that is found in the current film was actually an artifact of the way it was edited that someone didn't get the word. And we do know that when the film was printed in one of the so-called supporting volumes for the Warren Commission, two of the frames were printed in the wrong order, which greatly mitigate the force of that back and to the left. And it's very reasonable to infer that in the process of editing to the film, anyone who has military experience knows the meaning of this phrase, somebody didn't get the word. And those two frames wound up being printed in, 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 in an order that ac accentuated this back and to the left motion, which may actually have, in fact, not taken place. So when Dan Rather reported that he'd seen the film on Saturday and the president fell forward and didn't report this back into the left, we surmise that, in fact, he may be giving an accurate report of what he actually saw then because this was before the film had undergone more extensive alteration. Some claim that he, it's proof, Jack Valenti, who used to be an aide to uh, LBJ, insisted it was proof that there had been no conspiracy and no one talked. Well, if you look at a book by Noel Twyman entitled Bloody Trees, and quite a brilliant book, it's nearly 900 pages long, talking about the individuals and groups who appear to have been involved. You'll find on a single page, he identifies eight different individuals, including Carlos Marcello, Santo Traficante, who were mafiosi, who were biggest, you know, among the biggest mob leaders in the country, who were talking that Jack was going to get hit before the assassination took place. Joseph Miltier, a right winger down in uh, Miami, uh, explained to an undercover agent, he didn't realize he was an informant for the FBI, that, that uh, Jack was going to be hit by being assassinated with a rifle from a building and they were going to pick up somebody to throw him off. Uh, many others, including Lyndon Johnson mentioned here, Lyndon Johnson began an affair with a woman named Madeline Duncan Brown in 1948. Uh, she bore him a son in 1950. This is not Lyndon's only child out of wedlock, but it was his only male offspring. And um, M Madeline and I had over 100 conversations. I interviewed her at a national uh, convention 
for the record on tape, and she is the real deal in my estimation. What she has to say fits with all the other evidence we know. And what is most important in capsule summary that she has to tell us is that she had a rendezvous with Lyndon on the uh, New Year's Eve after the assassination at the Driscoll Hotel in Austin, Texas. And she confronted him with rumors rampant in Dallas at the time that he'd been personally involved. He blew up at her and told her that the oil boys in the CIA decided that Jack had to be taken out. Her testimony has been confirmed by Billy Saul Estes, the Texas Wheeler dealer who is involved in a lot of a lot of uh, action with uh, Lyndon and Connolly and their cronies and brought in a huge amount of money, lots of scams and scandals, who's now published a book called The Texas Legend where he confirms that uh, Lyndon had sent his chief administrative assistant, Cliff Carter, down to Dallas to make all, sure all the arrangements were in place and how one of the uh, key persons involved in the assassination was a fellow named Malcolm Mac Wallace who actually had killed uh, numerous other persons for, for Lyndon, I think in uh, Bar McClellan's book, uh, Blood, Money, and Power, where he's confirming knowledge of Lyndon's involvement with his law company, his law firm, in planning the assassination. He enumerates about 10 different deaths, including one of Lyndon's own sisters that Mac Wallace performed on behalf of LBJ. There are uh, others here I could talk about, and some of whom I knew personally, uh, including the f the, a fellow who was an extraordinary character who was a counterfeiter and a painter and an artist and at one time had been Meyer Lansky's accountant and if any of you know the history of organized crime there's no more sensitive position in the history of the organization than to be Meyer Lansky's accountant who was at the time working as a contract agent for the CIA in Los Angeles at the Los Angeles Stamp and Stationery Store where he was directed by his handler Philip Twombly by name to prepare 15 sets of forged Secret Service credentials for use in and around Dealey Plaza. And he prepared them and he took them down there and the red pickup truck wasn't there where he was supposed to leave them so he wandered around Dealey Plaza. He told me he saw more, more bad guys, more assassins and murderers than you'd find at a Soldiers of Fortune convention. And apparently all these people were, had been dumped into Dealey Plaza to create distractions and false leads if uh, an investigation took place. Finally, I return to this photograph. Um, Jack White, who's a celebrated photo analyst and who's been a leader in, in several different areas, but especially in detecting anomalies in, in, in JFK-related photographs, noticed that those newspapers have known dimensions. And therefore, you could use them as an internal yardstick to determine the height of the person uh, in the photograph. Uh, in, in Lee Oswald was 5 foot 10. But when you use the newspapers to lay off the height of the individual, he turns out only to be five foot five, far too short to have been Lee Oswald. Or alternatively, the newspapers were introduced with too large dimensions. Either way, conclusive proof that the man was right when he said this was a fake photograph. His face pasted on somebody else's body, which leads to raise the question why it would have been necessary to frame a guilty man. And the answer to that question, I presume, at this point in time is obvious. Thank you. And I uh, appreciate very much all the work you've put into looking at the uh, conspiracy here. But I have a question. Sure. I saw a program on TV recently, maybe within the last month, on the Discovery Channel. It, I can't identify it to you who put the program on, but there was some uh, people who were trying to reenact the magic bullet, th bullet theory. They went to great efforts to make uh, torsos of bodies with ribs in them and various things and did all this uh, analysis of the heights of the seats in the car and the angles and all this. And they actually f used the gun, the same type of gun with a scope and had an expert shoot and they shot a bullet, went through Kennedy, went through Conley's chest went through his wrist and in their enactment it came out and uh, was laying on the lap of the of the torso basically well this was just down in Australia thing yeah, this is from Australia so I yeah. was wondering I'm not here as a critic I was just wondering what your analysis of this is no no let me let, let me liken it to the uh, the computer reconstruction that was on ABC, which I have described as spectacular disinformation, using work by a fellow named Dale Myers, who uh, 
who, who offered a reconstruction of the assassination. Now there's a principle in computer science known as G-I-G-O, garbage in, garbage out. You can make a computer display anything you want. The fact is that the evidence we have that is the best evidence as to whether or not this sh the scenario went down the way the government claims, the pivot, the focal point of which is the magic bullet theory, is that it's a fantasy, it's a fabrication, it's a hoax. And the fact that they could try to arrange things to replicate a fantasy, a fabrication, or a hoax doesn't make it any less a fantasy, a fabrication, or a hoax. Now, the most interesting case to me was an interactive uh, internet website called JFK Reloaded that provided the opportunity for you to rehearse a shooting sequence. You saw the motorcade come up uh, Houston turn on to Elm and drive away, and there, was, uh, there were unlimited opportunities for practice, and then you could have 10 actual opportunities to ride, try to replicate Oswald's shooting, okay? The weapon was much better than the Oswald weapon, which had a defective scope that was improperly mounted. It had a, a hair trigger with a double action. I, every time you worked the bolt, it, it threw you off of the target. None of those were true of this uh, attempt to, to simulate the shooting in Dealey Plaza. Uh, hundreds, probably thousands of persons tried it out, and the, the best possible shooter scored like uh, 788 out of 1,000. In other words, he could only get a C plus in trying to replicate Oswald's shooting. Uh, experts from the Marine Corps have concluded it wasn't possible. Experts from Israel concluded it wasn't possible. I can assure you as a former Marine Corps, Corps officer used to supervise recruit training, th this isn't even remotely plausible. The guy was a mediocre shot in 1957. He, f he qualified with 212 and 58. He didn't qualify at all, which is odd because every Marine Corps uh, enlisted or officers required to qualify every single year and I believe he's undergoing Russian language instruction at the time and that's why he wasn't qualifying but then in 1959 he qualified with a 191 so he dropped 21 points in two years 191 is barely qualifying that was probably giving him a gift because if you're working the pits and you know somebody's barely you know not going to qualify you tend to give him the extra point or two if that's what he needs at the end he was a terrible shot there's no evidence he maintained his marksmanship ability uh, and it, this is a very practice dependent skill. The weapon was a piece of junk. If he had been using an M1 on which he was actually trained, he would have had a far superior weapon. Uh, I could go on at great length about this, but these reconstructions really are, are essentially meaningless given what we know. I mean, just go back and say, does that change the hole in the shirt? Does that change the hole in the jacket? Does that change the location of the wound described in the autopsy diagram or the FBI diagram or what the president's personal physician wrote in the autopsy report? See, they're making up the facts on which the case depends, and we have demonstrated that they're not only false, they're provably false and not even anatomically possible. What, what I meant to show you here by way of conclusion, by the way, is a su superior version of the film that has been put together by uh, John P. Costella, a PhD in physics, who's an expert in light and the physics of moving objects, who's done the most brilliant work on the film. And one of the reasons why the film had to be recreated, I mean, I take it it's obvious that if you saw the driver slow down, pull the limousine to a halt until Jack was hit twice in the head and killed, that it would have been obvious the Secret Service was involved. They had to take that out. One of the problems they had, therefore, was the deceleration and reacceleration. And if you watch very carefully, those are going to be hard for you to see. Uh, just as Jack's being hit in the head and this blood is spilling up and there's so many things here that indicate that this is a fake film. The blood disperses much too fast, for example. But just look at the other passengers right after Jack is hit. It's almost impossible to divert your attention. We have persons who have seen an unedited version of this film. And among other things, not only did they confirm that in the original you saw the motorcade come up Houston, that the driver swung out too widely, nearly hit a concrete abutment, and then tried to pull back toward the center, pulled the limo to a left and to a halt, but that he did so in a very aggressive fashion. It was a, he, he jostled the passengers. Uh, well, I think they may have thought that seeing that jostling was something that might stick in your head, so they actually included it here. They have some frames or parts of frames that were derived from when the limo was brought to a halt, except here they're being portrayed as though it were accelerating. So if you watch, you'll see John Connolly and his wife Nellie and the Secret Service agents all lurching forward ever so briefly for just a couple of frames right as Jack is hit. But the evidence we have is really extensive and detailed and meticulous. For example, they put, they put in the Stemmons freeway sign in the wrong fashion. The, the, the film has, um, 
is distorted. The original, this is an undistorted version of the original, which has pincushion distortion at the corners. It's pulled out at each of the corners. And when they put in the, uh, the film, the, the sign back into the recreated film, they, they forgot to take into account pincushion distortion, which leads to detectable variations, just as there are detectable variations with a light pole and, and a whole host of other things. Persons are turning from back to forward uh, way too fast to be humanly possible. Uh, twice as fast, in fact, uh, Noel Twyman hired athletes to, uh, to stand in for. The driver, for example, when found in two cases, he turns backwards, forwards, or forwards back too fast, twice as fast as humanly possible, which may not sound like much, except it would then turn a four-minute mile into a two-minute mile. Just to show you one or two features of the film, uh, they use techniques of optical printing and uh, special effects. The bilging out of the head, for example, uh, Noel Twyman consulted with Roderick Ryan, an ex-Hollywood expert in special effects, and Roderick Ryan told him that this had been painted in, this bilging out. And notice how I, I observed that the one x-ray was really designed, it would appear to be compatible with that, and yet Jackie said, and you saw a photograph, that there was actually nothing wrong with the front of his head. He, he didn't have that missing part of the head that would be necessary if that were authentic. But in addition, look at all these bystanders. If you look at other footage of the motorcade, you'll see they're wildly yelling and cheering when Jack Kennedy shows up wildly yelling and cheering, and here they aren't. And we believe what is going on is they took an original pilot film before JFK has shown up, and they use that original pilot film and then combine it with the background using its techniques of optical printing that now you can com combine any features you want to create a film in order to produce this. So it's, it's really quite fascinating. And, if, and th th these, by the way, sprocket hole areas are the actual reason why they had to create, recreate the whole film. It's because those scro sprocket hole areas reflect images from the prior and the following frames. So you can't just take out individual frames and replace them because you'd have to replicate those sprocket hole areas, which is technically virtually impossible to do. So what they had to do was create whole new sequences. In other words, they had to reshoot the film, but of course that was part and parcel of what they were doing. Let me, let me just conclude about the discussion of the film, and one of my books is entitled The Great Zapruder Film Hoax, and if you want to see the studies that provide conclusive evidence of what I'm explaining here, because it became the background of the entire assassination cover-up, they, 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 they contracted the time frame and altered you know, events going on so that if you take for granted that the film is authentic, it'll be logically impossible to reconstruct what actually happened in Dealey Plaza that day. It, it just can't be done because you're basing it upon a false premise. But another discovery of the Assassination Record Review Board was that a fellow by the name of Homer McMahon was working in the National Photographic Interpretation Center Friday night of the assassination when he was brought a copy of the film of the assassination. He was asked to prepare a briefing board for unspecified officials who I surmise were probably either J. Edgar or Lyndon Johnson. And he was supposed to pre prepare a briefing board that show all the impacts of bullets on occupants in the limousine. So he watched the film at least 10 times. And he concluded that there had been six to eight impacts from at least uh, three different directions. Well, six to eight impacts, we got four in Jack and as many as three in Big John. That's seven, which is a number between six and eight. But, uh, but just to t tell you how Homer's evidence counts as a powerful testimony that the film was altered, no one could look at the extant film today and conclude that there had been six to eight impacts from at least three different directions. And that was precisely the sort of thing they had to conceal and cover up. And I would like to believe that on the basis of this evidence, you are convinced that the lone assassin hypothesis cannot account for the available evidence and that the death of JFK has to be attributed to a conspiracy and indeed one of a fairly large scale. Thank you.